We're, we're going to encounter Abraham right after he has rescued Lot from the hands of very powerful chieftains. And now he's kind of back with Lot and back and settled in. And I would imagine if I'm Abraham and I have just taken the bounty, the booty from these other kings that were much more powerful than I, that in a society which was characterized by the idea of lex teliensis or the law of retaliation, that there is a little, I'm going to get you back twice as bad, that might have been brewing among these other folks. And so it's at this point that God now comes to Abraham. And, and when it says the word of the Lord comes to Abraham here, that's a phrase that happens all throughout the prophets. And we're very familiar with that. And the word of the Lord came to, to Isaiah. But it is the only time in all of the law, like the heart of the covenant of the, of the Old Testament, in the heart of the law, the only time that the phrase and the word of the Lord came to is right here. And I would imagine it's because Abraham is probably sensing the idea that, all right, I won that victory, but everything seems a little bit shaky right now. I now am at war with a bunch of folks, and I still haven't born a child, and I'm getting really old at this point in time, and Sarah's, yeah, she's, she's still a beautiful woman, but let's face it, her clock stopped ticking a long time ago. And so, here, here it comes. Genesis 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Uh, there's two things that he's promising here, both addressing probably the two things that are in Abram's mind. One is, how am I going to be protected from these warlords that I just ticked off in a very major way? And then secondly, how am I going to see the promise and the reward of the family line continued? And God comes to him and says, hey, Abraham, I got you. I got you. I got your back with a shield against those warlords and, and also your reward, your very great reward of the promise that I've been giving to you. I am it. And it is going to be fulfilled. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. There is a theme running through this passage, which is very interesting because this is the one passage where Abraham's faith is going to be exalted quite remarkably and it'll be credited to him as the righteousness that puts you in right standing with God all based on his faith but here's what's interesting is in the midst of all of this we see doubt about the title of the sermon today is how can I know it's actually the centerpiece of this passage and it's a question that that Abram will ask in so many different words and in these very words as well how can I know? And who doesn't have that sense as we're before God? How can I know, God? And for me growing up, I had a, a dad that was quite fun and gregarious and exciting in many ways. But also, he was also a dad that said a lot of big things. But honestly, not many of those big things ever really came about. Even those promises of what you and I were going to do together, son... You know, those things didn't really come about. But, you know, I, I tried to have a positive attitude. He's like, he's my dad and he's a lot of fun. And yeah, he may say that he's going to buy us all Corvettes. But, you know, that's just him talking. <laughs> I did say that. As I, you know, that's just a big, that's just his way of being encouraging. Now, here's sadly what I can imprint upon God from having that imprinted upon me as a little boy. God's the same way. Right. God says a lot of really cool stuff. Right. That, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be able to do even greater things than Jesus. Yeah. You know what? Big talk. Really nice. Very encouraging. But, you know, that's just how God is. He's he's outgoing. He's gregarious. He's encouraging. He kind of lavishes these big words upon you. But, hey, maybe it comes through. Maybe it doesn't come through. But I'm just going to kind of enjoy my relationship with him, even if he's not good to his word. Right. And ah. That's frightening, but that is a big part of what I've had to deal with in me really trying to trust God all my life. Now, there's another part that is very difficult, too, with me with God, is that I also know that in my character as a, a boy growing up and even as a young man before I came to know the Lord and even after I came to know the Lord, that I also 
said I was going to do a lot of great things. And my integrity didn't back it up. And I've made a lot of promises that were likewise not in any way fulfilled or perhaps not even really intended to be fulfilled. And so as I enter into kind of a relationship with God and this idea of a covenant with God, or even one day as I came to study the Bible and realized that there's going to be a moment where I call on the name of the Lord and I state publicly, Jesus is Lord, as Timothy did before many witnesses that Paul describes in the uh, New Testament. That I'm going to say, that, am I going to be able to stand on the integrity of that great public profession, knowing who I am? And do I have a God that's got my back? No, no matter what through this. This is the dynamic that is being played out in scripture right here, has played out in my life, perhaps in your life as well. How can I know? And that how can I know cuts both ways. How can I know God's coming through? And how can I know that I can actually even enter into this without falling flat and making a, a worse mess of, of my life and my relationship with God as well? So reading on. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Verse 4. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And then he does something rather intimate with Abraham. I, I almost vision him as, you know, his arm around him, looking up. But it is, of course, in a vision. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. This is a massive theological statement that God just makes right here. Is the fact that Abram is now considered righteous means that he is in full intimacy, right relationship with God. That's righteousness. Anybody who has righteousness has the ability to approach the throne of God with confidence. Knowing that I deserve to be here. Righteousness, a good kind of working definition of that, is a performance record that opens doors. Whether that be a righteousness in your, in your company, that you have a performance record that opens doors, or at your school, or in your, your application processes, or with God, that you have a performance record where you're like, you know what, I got this. I think I'm going to be all right with God as we come together in this issue. Abram now has that. And what did he do? Do to do that? He didn't do anything. All he simply did is look up and trust. Now here's what's astounding. This statement is made right after Abram has done what? He's gone to Egypt and he's offered up Sarah as his sister, jeopardizing all of the promises of God that a foreign Gentile Pharaoh would actually have his wife sexually. Whoa, right? It also says... That that wasn't a one-time issue in Abraham's life. Again, everything hinges on this one big promise. Through your wife Sarah, Abraham, you will become a blessing for all nations. You're my reclamation plan for all the world. You know that flood that happened? You know all the nuts and the babel and all the, the mess that is attended to this world? Well, I am going to fix it all. And it's going to come through you and Sarah and the child that you will have one day. And yet it says in Genesis 20, not just was it a one event when he went down to Egypt and said, hey, here's Sarah. What do you think about her, Pharaoh? It says whenever they went anywhere, Genesis 20, verse 13, he said, hey, whenever we go anywhere, Sarah, why don't you do this? Tell everybody you're my sister. I think it'll go better for us. And she does it yet one more time with Abimelech and ends up in his harem as well. So in the middle of all of this consistent Faltering, God looks at Abraham and says, you trust. You trust when I show you all these stars and you trust that so will your offspring be. I credit you now with a performance record that puts you in good stead. You are in perfect alignment with me and my will and, and relationship with me. That's massive. It's so massive, by the way, and it's such an important statement because Romans 4 tells us this was not made for Abraham alone but for all who would have this faith, would likewise this credited righteousness be. 
As you sit here, because of you coming to no longer trust in your own agenda and will for your life, but now instead trust in Jesus, so you will have credited to you a performance record that opens doors. Jesus died for our sins, that Romans 4 passage concludes, but he was raised for our righteousness. Jesus rose so that we could have accredited righteousness to us as well. And what we do is what Abraham did. We trust. We believe. But let's move on here because it's very easy to have this double doubt of how can I know God? How can I know, Ed, if this thing is going to actually hold water? Verse 7. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land and take possession of it. It's as though God is saying, yes, you trust. And by the way, that trust is well founded. Am I not the one who walked with you, carried you, protected you, guided you out of your homeland of Ur of Babylon all the way up to Haran and then all the way down into Canaan? Have I not blessed you all along the way here in this new land? And even when you denied me in Egypt, was I not there? Did I not also have your back? Did I not also protect Sarah? Did I not bless you and allow you to return again to the depth of the relationship with me? And now even this situation with Lot, did I not again protect and cover you to be able to bring you to this place? It's very encouraging that God would be saying this to him. But then look at what Abraham says next. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know? Well, God just said, here's how you know. How about everything that I've walked with you on this entire way? And Abram's like, how can I know? You know, some of us sit here and, and maybe think, wow, you know what? I think if I had a direct call like Abram had from God, that if God put his arm around me, looked up at the stars and said, check it out. Charles, look at the stars of the sky. Right? So, so we all... You'd be like, you know what? If I had that experience, I think I would be rather fired up in my walk with God. Right? I, I think if I had that kind of a, it's called a theophany. That is a, a physical appearing of God into kind of the physical world. It happens at the burning bush. It happens for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when a fourth guy ends up in the pillar with them. It's actually going to happen in this chapter. Again, not, not just with the, the, the audible kind of physical appearance of God, but there'll be a physical, visual appearance of God in a moment, by the way. But if I had that, if I had God say to me, I'm going to bless you, you're going to be my, my great nation. Wow, you watch my smoke. I would go after it. And, and I think, you know what? I think if we were in uh, heaven with, with Abraham years from now, and we're, we're sitting and talking with him, and he, and he says, uh, hey, Charles, I heard what you said back in 2017. How uh, like, oh yeah, if I, if I had what Abraham had, if I had that kind of interconnection with God, watch my smoke. Charles, here's what it was like. I'm an old man. I'm schlepping around the promised land. I get, I get one word from the Lord at the age of 75. I don't hear bupkis from him from like another 12 years. And then like an, another 10 years later, the, the promises start kind of eking in again. And then like another year after that, I get one more big promise. And in that silence, never mind the silence of the one to two years, but the silence of a decade. And I'm getting older and I'm, I'm hitting 100 years old. And I'm trying to even remember, what, is that exactly the way he said it? Was that really rock solid? Was that just kind of thinking out loud? Are we just kind of spitballing, brainstorming right now? God, is, you know, all of those things probably go through my mind. And you, Charles, you could look at the full word of God, the full counsel of God anytime you wanted. And if you were unsure, you could just study that. And you could see the major sweep and arc of all the ways that God has worked in every single person's life. And in all the prophets that came later. And then fulfilled in Jesus. You want to switch places? <laughs> what I would do. You should see my smoke back in Genesis. If I had what you had. If I could just kind of pull open my iPad. And just check it out at any point in time. Man, you watched the rock-solid walk that I would have had at that time. On he goes. Sovereign Lord, how can I know? How can I know 
that I shall gain possession of it. So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. At this point in time, God knows what's about to go down. Abram knows exactly what's about to go down. You and I are completely dumbfounded at what is going on at this point in time. Because this is about to make no sense to us. Abram brought all these to him, cut the, them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. The birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. This is all very strange, and this is basically an illustration of the scene. As Abraham is still wondering, how can I know? But what is being set up here that Abram knows, and that God knows, and that the readers of the book of Genesis would have known, and that would have been very familiar to them, that the prophets would have known, that the prophets wrote about in a, in a passage that is interesting in Jeremiah. I'll, I'll just read it to you. Jeremiah writes something interesting about God making another agreement. What is going down here is a covenant ratification. Let me read this to you. There was another covenant that God had made concerning slaves. And the Israelites had had some slaves into their possession but God said, it is only right, based on jubilee, based on social justice, that you free those slaves. But the Israelites did not free those slaves. And God said, you are violating the covenant and you ratified that covenant. We made a covenant that looked like this and you violated it. And this is what God says. Those who have violated my covenant and have not filled the ter terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walked between its pieces. So what, what does this mean, this, this covenant thing here about cutting animals in two and then walking between the pieces? Very strange to our ears because probably you've never entered into a covenant like this. But if you've ever entered into a big covenant, and I think about the biggest early covenant in my life, early in, in my life, kind of an, an official covenant, and it was buying a house. And it was in 1988. And it was in Richmond, Virginia. I remember thinking, oh my goodness, I am about to sign a covenant agreement with the bank to own this. And, and also with all this, I, in my mind was going to be a, a full big oak table of lawyers all gathered around. And so I remember thinking, oh man, this is the day. I mean, the night before, I was nervous. It was difficult to sleep. I set like three alarm clocks to make sure that I would wake up to not be late for this covenant signing that was going to go down. Uh, I remember I, I actually dressed up in my nicest suit that I had. Not, I wore a tie back then. I, had a, I, I brought my, my, my Mont Blanc Meisterstuck big fountain pen with me to be able to sign those documents with real flourish. This is like a big, big deal. I, I remember even like having a checklist of double checking. Make sure you have your ID. Make sure you have all the documentation. I had my license with me. I thought, oh, I'll bring a, I'll bring a birth certificate as well. Who knows what else they need for this thing? <laughs> this is, I was like, oh, I'm about to do it. I'm about to enter into a real covenant agreement. And then I remember walking into the room and these stacks of paper. And there were lawyers there. and There were the, the title company. There was the mortgage company. They were all there. It was a bigger deal back then. Uh, and and, and we, all, we all sat down. And I remember with, with every, I mean, trying to listen, hanging on every word, actually reading those things back at that time. You know, signing on every single, and, and at the end of it all, how we, we realized, like, this was such a big deal. And then the stand up and the handshake that I was able to give, you know, to the bank and to the lawyer and to the, 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 the title company and the congratulations. And then as the documents were all signed and ratified and then the keys were placed in my hands. And I remember thinking, whoa, like, oh my goodness, am I going to be good for this? You know, are, are they going to be good for this? But, but it seems as though that we've, we have really done something here to really commit to that pretty deeply. Now, that was 1988. Today you buy a house and some schmo in a, in a Steelers hoodie shows up. Uh, <laughs> With a, with a $5 notary pad. But back then, like, this was a big deal. How much of a bigger deal would it be if instead I was asked 
to go ahead and cut up, bring a heifer, a, a cow, a goat, a ram, and then to, to br- cut them down the middle, separate the halves, create a trough of blood because covenants are ratified in blood. And then as I walk through that covenant, what I would be stating is that I'm walking a course of a curse. The, the course down the middle of these animals is for me to, to be within and to see up close. Is for me to look at this and say, if I break this covenant, may the curse that I am seeing with my own eyes be upon me. And I agree to let it be upon me if I should break this covenant. So Abraham is thinking, how can I know? How can I know? And God is saying, oh, we're going to make this clear. And I'm sure Abraham is thinking, when kind of a king and a vassal makes this sort of a, an agreement, the king doesn't usually go through. Maybe, maybe it's just me going through, but I'm still going to, I think at the end of this, be wondering, is God all in on this? Is he really going to make right on this? Because we're marching down the decades now, and all I keep getting is... At a boy, Abram, one day, boy, oh boy, it's going to be terrific as the, the, the greatness really comes your way. So Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. This is a ugly, disturbing Sleep of dread that he's experiencing right now. Then the Lord said to him, you want to know? Know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and ill-treated there. Here's what's so amazing. God is not just kind of confirming the promise of the heirs. He's now confirming to him, this is what's going to happen to you and your heirs For the next four centuries. Actually way beyond that as well. We're we're, we're talking about a millennia of clear laid out promise that God is providing for him right now. But I will punish the nation they serve there, Egypt, as slaves. And afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation your descendants will come back here. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. By the way, some people also have an issue with God that he would wipe out the inhabitants of the promised land for the sake of his own privileged people. Is that really fair? God here is saying, you know what? The people that inhabit this land have so polluted it with their repulsive, sinful lives that I could wipe them out right now. But I'm going to give them a second chance And another second chance. You know what? I'm going to give them 400 years more of second chances. Until the, again, the anathema wretchedness of their filth is so overflowing that it will be clear to everyone that they need to be taken out of this land. And that this land is cleansed of the pollution and the corruption that they have wreaked upon it. Again, that's, that's another, another issue, but it is interesting that he puts it here. Now, when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking brazier, it's like a, uh, it's, 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 it could be translated in a lot of different ways, uh, and, and I'll get into it in a minute. And a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, And said to your descendants, I will give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. What is this in response to? Abram saying, how can I know? And then God does this to say, now know for certain. And here's what happens, is that Abram, I'm sure, is thinking, all right, the pieces are set up. Then he experiences just the sleep of dread. It is a darkness that is almost unnatural in its description, in the depth of its disturbance. And yet then he awakens, and he awakens to see this image of a a big smoking pot, a big kettle of smoke, and then a second image 
of a torch ablaze. But it's the word used for lightning as well. And it's as though lightning has, in a sense, re remained in the shape of a torch. And these two things have appeared before him. And Abram, then as he watches, I'm sure with the most keen interest that anybody has ever watched anything, he then sees something really remarkable. He sees a theophany. A theophany is God making himself somehow visually manifest, like the burning bush. But ultimately, every theophany is a mere shadow of the ultimate theophany, the ultimate appearance of God to us. And how does that happen? In Jesus. Every small appearance of God, whether it be in the burning bush or in the furnace of fire or on the, the mountain of Mount Sinai. You know, even on Mount Sinai, when God came down and descended on it, it was attended with smoke that billowed and with fire. That's Exodus 19.18. In Exodus 20.18, when people saw the thunder and lightning and saw the mountain of smoke, they trembled with fear because the Lord was there. Those two words, this billowing smoke and this lightning image, are the two words that are also in our text right now. And they are images of God. But now Abram is dealing with these doubts. He's got two doubts. The first doubt is, God, are you going to come through for me? How can I know that you've got this God? And he then would be assured like no one else has ever been assured. Because now he sees, unlike a typical king and subject agreement, where the king in his graciousness says, I will enter into a covenant with you. You now, in my presence, walk through the course of the curse. You walk through the mutilated, butchered pieces. And in doing so, you and I, as great as I am and as lowly as you are, you and I... We're bonded. We're in agreement from, from that point forward. Even that, Abram thought, would be a tremendous thing. But God does something more to let Abram know. God, in the appearance of the, of the smoke and of the lightning, he watches and it says, they passed between the pieces. God, unlike many of the kings of that day, God was saying to Abram, I'm entering into this agreement with you. If I should break this covenant with you, if I should break these promises with you, Abram, let me be mutilated. Let me in my immortality be made mortal. Let me in my perfection, let me be mutilated if I should break this covenant with you, Abram. And I'm sure Abram then thought, wow, I've got a God who really is meaning what he says, that he should go through that. But it doesn't answer the other doubt that I'm sure that Abram had and that I had and that you have when you enter into a covenant with God. Yes, we may get it, that God is good to his word. And by the way, if we don't get it, it seems as though from this passage, God wants you to wrestle with your doubts. As a matter of fact, our faith should be so vibrant in a great God that we should live by faith as Abram did. I, he left Ur. He left Haran. He went to the promised land. He made, he, he made altars right in front of enemy people. He laid it all on the line. He trusted in God to have a kid when he's 100 years old. If you're living on that kind of faith, it makes sense that you're going to have doubts. If you no longer live for yourself, but for him who died for you and was raised again, and you're leaving it all on the field and you're living for Jesus, and suddenly you're making choices about where you live, who you date, whom you will marry. You make choices all based on a completely different criteria because now it is all based on the fact that Jesus is Lord of your life. When you're living it and leaving it all on the field like that, it only makes sense if you're really living fully by faith that you're going to have some doubts. It's very easy to just show up for church, read through your daily bread, think some positive thoughts about God, and live just like the rest of polite society. And not have any doubts. Why? Because that doesn't really require that much trust. That's an anemic, gutted version of Christianity that would be foreign to the pages of the New Testament. And to just live in that sort of polite, nice, genteel way is not Christianity. 
Jesus says, the world will hate you if you're really following me. They hated me. What do you think? They're not going to hate you? You have a better way? And yet if we're living it and enduring all that comes with the persecutions, with the sacrifices, with the radical new lifestyle, my goodness, I hope that we're living on such an edge that it does require faith. Faith that actually does rear up with doubts. And those doubts, God welcomes. Because you know why? Because he's good for every one of them. Matter of fact, those doubts, when you deal with them, rather than just kind of squelch them, they're only going to deepen your faith. And, and God forbid that we ever become a church where, oh, let's not admit to having doubts. What the heck? That either means that we've just become such a milk toast version of Christianity that maybe no doubts arise, or that we've become such a hypocritical, pharisaical group that we're like, oh, how dare you have doubts? Nobody has doubts. That's not how we live our Jesus. No, have doubts. Let's wrestle through our doubts. Let's get deeper. Let's get stronger. Let's get more trusting of Jesus along the way. But that's not often what we're... We're in a society where the common culture is doubt is a virtue. And that's not okay either. That extreme. Oh, how can you be so certain of something? You're so closed-minded is actually what you'll hear more often. And well, maybe I should doubt. No, no, no. You shouldn't doubt some things that are basic. But, but when you're going to have to trust God completely in such a way that you can only trust in God, yes, that's when doubts will arise. But just to have doubts because you want to be in vogue and because you want to kind of relate better to society, no, that's when Jesus says to Thomas, all right, let's deal with the doubts. All right, stick your finger in here. You get it? Stick your hand in here. You get all right, you clear on this? Great. You know what? I'm glad that you had the doubts. I'm glad we were able to talk through this. I'm glad you were able to stick your hand inside my thorax. Love it. But then what does he say at the end? Stop doubting and believe. Right? Let's deal with the doubts, but let's keep moving on from them as well. But so he's, he's got the doubts with God settled, but there's one more doubt. Can I come through? And I think that's the doubt that we all have. Am I going to be able to come through in this covenant? Am I going to be able to stand up, as I said earlier, and state with sincerity and with fidelity, Jesus is Lord? Will I be able to do that? Well, this is the remarkable thing, is that there wasn't just one theophany. There wasn't just one appearance from God. There were two. First, the billowing, smoking kettle went through. And then Abraham probably thought, okay, now I go. I guess I'm going to go now. But there's no mention of Abram going through. Something that he could have never imagined when this whole ordeal began and as he was sawing these animals in two, something he never imagined now occurs before his very eyes and he looks on in wonder. There is a second appearance of God. It is lightning in the formation of a fiery torch. It is astounding and it is a ratification of God again. And now look what's happening. God is going through again. In a sense to say, Abram, you're not going through. You're not going to walk the course of the curse. Instead, if I break this covenant, may I be mutilated. And Abram, if you break this covenant, may I be mutilated. And Abram experienced grace in a way that he could have never imagined. That even when he falters again in Genesis 20, he'll be able to look back at this covenant ratification and realize God went through. But the one thing that he could never know is, what would it look like if he did? Like, what will it look like when I break the covenant? And, and in fact, he did break the covenant. And his descendants after him, who are the heirs of the covenant, will break the covenant. And those errors include you, and you, and you, and me. What happens when we break the covenant? Will God actually walk through? Here's the amazing thing. He did. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Galatians 3, 13. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a cross. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to us. How amazing is that? So that by faith we receive the promise. On the cross, 
Mark records in the sixth hour, it was noon, darkness fell over the land. And Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What has happened here? He is bearing the curse. He is being slaughtered. He is being mutilated. Because Abraham broke the covenant. And because I broke the covenant. And because you broke the covenant. And rather than Abraham or you or me bear the brunt or walk the course of the curse. God has already said, I will do this. Every other religion, you have to walk the course of the curse. Every other religion, you have to walk through. Don't you dare ever entertain someone who says, oh, all religions are essentially the same. Garbage. It is only in Jesus, only in Christianity, where you do not walk through the curse of the covenant. Because God is doing it and has done it for us. That word cut is the word that was also used of making a covenant. In verse 18 of Genesis 15, instead of making a covenant, the word is actually used, they cut a covenant. A curse that cut Jesus. A curse that cut him literally. A curse that cut him off. We're about to commune with Christ in recognition of the Last Supper. And in Luke 22, Jesus said, when the hour came, and he said to his disciples as they reclined at the table, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God with you. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, This, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink of it again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Gave it to them, saying, This is my body. My body given over for you. Do this in remembrance of me. God has always had this plan with a heart bursting of love to have a real covenant relationship with you. One where you don't have to doubt God and you don't even have to doubt yourself. And if you faltered, he would make good on this. He made good on this. He became a curse for us so that we could become a covenant people of God with confidence. And that we are. And so we take this communion now with confidence, knowing that it was God's plan from before time as we could imagine for us to assert again the confidence, the faith, the trust, the righteousness that we have as we share in this communion. A communion that costs Jesus by walking the course of the curse, but blesses us as it affirms us for righteousness now and to share in it forever in his kingdom. Pray first for the bread.